this ad I just used on this one minute only to make an uh, announcement that I need to make the judgment uh, for the schedule since uh, the schedule for spring semester um, for our class is final on uh, April the 30th, not, not um, May the 5th. So, um, this is the day for our final, and, um, and you have only 27 uh, written response. Out of 27, you hand for me 25, uh, so that we can get 50 points. Okay. Instead of 28 at the beginning, I have not checked. Uh, before, I didn't check the schedule, final exam schedule. So again, please, if you do the presentation, please remember this date. Okay, Wednesday. Who, who does? So what's changing here? Um, final paper and presentation on... Are going to be due on the 30th instead? Yeah, 30th instead of uh, May the 5th, because okay. we just check the final exam. And um, half 27, you hand me 25, so that you get 50 points. Okay, so we won't do number 28? No, okay. this is the last one. Okay, let's move on. All right, um, let's see here. Okay, what do you have? Uh, yeah, I'm very good at that. Sorry, I was doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay. um, I had uh, Zen in India. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Uh, the heart of Zen is uh, Satori. Uh, it's an awakening or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It uh, it is the awakening to the true potential face. So it's the ultimate reality of it all. Uh, when the heart comes to life, it blossoms in compassion for all beings. Um, which is, uh, I couldn't say their names, Pradina uh, and Karuna, Karuna um, Enlightenment and Compassion, those are the names for them, are the essence of Zen in a way that two faces of one realization. Um, Zen meditation is also a therapeutic component and it helps stimulate the healing and the completeness of the whole person, the spirit and mind. It supports liberation. I couldn't really find, I found about like where it started okay. um, in India, but it, I really couldn't find a whole bunch. It just said it started in India and um, they, I forget who came over, at, uh, uh, they brought it over from India to China and then from there it went to Japan and became known as Zen or Zena. In Korea it's known as Sun. Um, but it started out as Zen Buddhism and is now like its own separate sect from Buddhism itself. It's uh, taken, it's, it's evolved. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let me stop for a moment. I'd like to introduce two guests here. Uh, our neighbors, they come down with us to do meditation every Friday morning from 10 to 11. Um, what else? And Mark too, mine is down there too. <laughs> so you can sit down, it's okay. You can sit down. Okay. What do you have there? I also had issues finding anything very much about um, Zen Buddhism in India. It, okay. I did find that the Indian Dhyana, Dhyana Master Buddha yeah. Arada was the founding abbot and patriarch of the Shaolin Temple. Oh, okay. And the Bodhidharma was the Buddhist Bikinu traditionally credited as the founder of Zen Buddhism in China, and he was the 20th patriarch okay. in India. Yeah. Is this what we talk about? Indian monk Atisa, holder of the mind train of teachings, is considered an indirect founder of the Gaelic school of Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's all you find? Yeah. Okay. Let me clarify to you. Um, the word Zen has come from Dhyana. That's Sanskrit, okay. and in Chinese it's called Chan. 
in Japanese called Zen. It's a short one. We have Zen iPod, right? Uh, Zen music, all kind of Zen, right? Uh, but they, they can use the label. So the Yana, this is this been by Chan, by Zen, or in, in, in the short form, meditation. So, a symbol of mindfulness, um, meditation, and different form of mindfulness. And they start from home, from Buddha. Remember? He sat under the Bodhi tree for four and a half days, right? That's, that's why he attained enlightenment. You do his practice of meditation, or it's a liana, or can that's all possible. Right? Um, and Throughout his lifetime, for 45 years of teaching, he focused his teaching, the practical teaching of meditation. Monks are now supposed to do meditation. And later on, when we resume the spread to China, Japan, and so forth, they have different ways how to end the mind. Like, um, they say Buddha names, they say the mind. But the main practice originally, the Dhyana. Meditation. Um, so the other one is, is like the memes or the. Um, it's many people they don't have patience to sit in meditation, so they decide the mantra, or if they have the faith, they decide with their names. That's what. But the point, the important uh, teaching of Buddha is meditation for the young. Is that clear? And this is a legend uh, in. Um, history is has not recorded yet, but according to legend, one day, uh, while the Buddha was preaching or uh, teaching, he he held a lot of flowers, like they hold, I held, hold this paper in front of the assembly of monks and nuns, and everyone stared at him. They don't, they didn't know what he what he tried to talk, what he tried to say, what he tried, what his meaning, but in the whole assembly, that's it, hundreds of thousands of them. Mahakeshiva, remember Mahakeshiva? The one who guarded the first Buddhist council, remember? The one still in Samadhi, to wait for the next Buddha to come to pass the robe and bows of the Buddhist authorities. So, his mouth, when the Buddha held that lot of flowers on his hand. You understand what's mean? Why? Why did that monk smiled. And other, later on, the Buddha said, Well, I have the treasuries of the Dharma eyes. Now, I pass to Makeshiva. You don't understand what's going on, right? He understood what was meant without any words. That's the point. Let's say, when, let's say, when you in love, right? With your boyfriend and girlfriends, any signal, right? Of him or her, you recognize that, right? Because you know his personality or her personality. Make sense? The third person couldn't know what's going on. Make sense? Without expression, orally, you know what she or he like to express. So there is the Buddha. So when he, he holds that flood of flowers, and this this Mahakishwa, he smiled. And Buddha said, well, I pass uh, my Dharma to you. Because you recognize my mind. Remember, we talk about what? How could he smile? When, when Buddha holy through the flowers, remember we talk about what? Remember that? Remember? Buddha nature, remember? Or pure nature. With that word, or intuition, with that word, with that expression, make sense? So that's what he recognized. He recognized why Buddha held the lot of flowers. Make sense? So that's according to the Zen tradition. That starts with Mahakishpa. Mahakishpa is considered as the first patron of Zen Buddhism in India. But actually, for a thousand years, from the time of the Buddha down to the 13th century, most amongst the nuns, they practice meditation. Of course, later on, they use 
mantra or Bhisattva Buddha names as a means to tame their minds. But that is, this is the most important teaching, practice, or techniques. Make sense now? Uh, so basically, it made you confused, right? When you talk about Zen, right? You, I, I think um, it's better if you can say that, oh, meditation in India, is that right? Much more understandable, right? It's not for Buddha, that's so It's simple. Okay, so don't mess up. Okay, now, uh, and that comes from, let me see. Okay, so in according to the Zen tradition, there is 27, 27 patriarchs. In India, and Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma is the 28th one. Who told the story about uh, Bodhidharma? Did you guys learn anything about Bodhidharma? We talked about him last time, right? Oh, not this one, sorry. Okay, here. Yeah. yeah, we talked about him briefly, right? Yes, sir. Wasn't he, uh, didn't he have a guy, um, a guy cut his arm off <gasps> to show loyalty? Not loyalty, sincerity. That's different, loyalty is different. Okay. Sincerity, mm -hmm. yeah. We talk about that, right? Um, so, this monk, he's a 28th Pajra, uh, according to Mahayana, according to the Zen traditions. He was a prince. Okay, you Kevin? Yeah. Are you Kevin? Yeah. Oh yeah, you ready to talk about him? Uh, sure. Go there, do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go um, now. <laughs> yeah, go now. Yeah. Well, they had multiple legends about him. Okay. They had, especially about his origins, mm -hmm. where there were some that say he, some from Southeast Asia say that he was from uh, different parts of India, uh, mostly southern, but there's no distinct province. There's another legend that says he was the third son of a king. I forgot my laptop, so I can't pull my paper up. It's okay. From a, he was the third son of a king, and. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to walk into this. <laughs> we wait for you. <laughs> yeah. um, what I found interesting is that he was depicted as having piercing blue eyes and an untamed beard, which is, which is what made him stand out in Asian culture because not, it's a very rare sight. He, uh, he was to transmit the Dharma from India to China, and when he did, he was meet, met by uh, Yao Xin, if I remember correctly, who he who had a big celebration for him. Then he went and met the emperor, and him and the emperor had such disagreements and such troubles communicating that he went to a temple in the mountains and meditated to facing a wall for nine years. Mm -hmm. And when he was facing the wall, that's where a lot of the legends about him came up. Uh, according to one that I remember off the top of my head, he cut off his eyelids mm -hmm. because he was so angry with himself for falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And when he fell, and then when his eyelids hit the ground, they grew into tea plants, mm -hmm. and that started the tradition of students being allowed tea in order to help them stay awake and concentrate. Okay. That's <laughs> that's what I remember off the top of my head. Okay. Okay. So again, yeah. You see his his eyebrows or his fear, look fearful, right? Um, so yes, he was a prince and he uh, left the palace to become a monk. And um, at that time, this was persecution in India. Uh, so his master, Abraham, you guys go, you go to the west. The east, sorry, this is in China to spread the Dharma. If you stay here, you may be executed. So he he went by boat from southern India to southern China. And at that time he met a Buddhist king or an emperor. Uh, I don't know whether I told you or not. This is the only this is the only Buddhist king that uh, became a monk. And later on he asked his advice uh, officers uh, to 
bring money and gold uh, to the, the temple so that they could get him back. So many times, remember I told you about that? Sorry. So anyway, so this, this emperor, he said, well, you know, I have to build hundreds of temples. I have thousands of monks known to practice. I print the sutra. I, I have done all kinds of um, goodness for Buddhism. Do you have any merit? Remember I told you that story? Right? And, and this monk, he said, no. So he spent for him. You know why? Why did he say no? You know why? OK, now here. Remember we studied about the cycle of rebirth, right? Yes. Right, remember? And the merits are going to Buddhism. Yeah, the merit that we have all the people, we do Buddhism and so forth. Uh, it's help us only to, to have better life in human realm, in heaven. But we still revolve around here. So according to this view, according to him, it's no use. Why? Because as much as you go, you you do a good merit, you come with, you may be born in heaven or may be born as human as billionaire and so forth. But when you use up all merit, you have to work again. You see. So in his view, in this monk view, the important thing is to recognize your Buddha nature. That is the ultimate goal, to get out of the birth cycle to achieve to Buddhahood. That is the, the ultimate goal, not to revolve in this samsara. That's why he is then further. You do good deed, but that's not good it is. Soon later will be aspiring, and you have to do it again. Mm, and mm, and mm, you, you would go up and down in this cycle, that's all. And that's not it. one legend. After that, the emperor could not um, keep him at the palace. So what happened? He went. He, he, he left the palace, and there's a picture, an image. And on the way, let me see here, this one. Okay, here. Look at this picture here on the left side. So on the way, going to the mountain, he, he needed to cross a river. So he he saw a, a ferry, new ferry, right? He wanted to step on that ferry so that people could bring him to the other side of the river. But they didn't allow him to go because at first he's a foreign monk. And second, he is look <laughs> differently <laughs> from, people, from common people. So they didn't allow him to to get onto the uh, the ferry. What happened? He picked up a branch. I couldn't legend. He picked up a, bra a branch of trees and stood there to, I guess, uh, to sail to the other shore. And from that time on, people look at him in a surprised way. So he went to remember which temple he he went to. Remember? Was it eighteen? Remember Shaolin? Shaolin Bang, Remember that? So he went there, he went to this temple and sat there for nine years while he's facing the wall. He sat and faced the wall for nine years. And later on, people recognized him as a strand of uh, that monks. So this monk, what is his name? Hui Ka. Hui Ka. He heard about the fame of this. Um, Bodhidharma. So he went to seek for the teacher. Look, he knew, remember I told you, he knew on the snow for three days and nights. Remember when the snow is too cold out there, right? He knew there for three, three days and nights. What happened? When he turned around, he said, what, what are you doing over there? So, he, so this Hoi he said, I seek a teaching from you. So he said, well, um, the effort of uh, kneeling down uh, on the snow for three days and now it's just nothing. So what happened? He went to the kitchen and got the knife and cut off his arm to show his sincerity. 
that they want to seek for the teaching. Of course, you say this is so extreme, right? You know, in, in the past, though, have some kind of extreme way to do, right? In the East and the West, right? So anyway, from that time on, he taught this monk the word of Dharma. And this monk asked him, okay, master, can you calm my mind? You know, that's a, that's a question when you, when you want to do meditation, right? right? You, you like to calm your mind, right? Because your mind is so, tur is so uh, turbulent, right? So he he's asked the same question to us. Master, can you calm my mind? And so the Dhamma, Dhamma, Bodhidharma, he said, wow, that's OK. Bring your mind here. Bring your mind out. I will, I will calm your mind. And Rekar, he looked around, he looked within himself for a while and said, I cannot find my mind. And Bodhidharma said, I calm my mind. I calm your mind already. You understand that? You understand that? Do you understand that, that conversation? You follow my conversation? Follow my explanation? So, the, this monk, he asked, Can you calm my mind? Right? So, this, so Bodhidharma said, Bring your mind out. I will calm your mind for you. And this monk looked within himself. He said, I cannot find my mind. And so Bodhidharma said, well, I calm your mind already. Make sense? Mm -hmm. What's me? Can you explain? What's me? So um, by searching for it, he calmed himself. Mm -hmm. And what else? You're almost there. <laughs> what else? More, more than that. Any, anything? Kevin, any, any hint? Really, I think that it, by him searching in his mind for it, it took his mind off of the things that were on his mind. So it helped calm it because it gave it something else to focus on. I can say that's one way. Uh -huh. What else? What else? What happened with our total mind? What happened? Like uh, stress? He said, he said that he couldn't find his mind. Yeah, he said he couldn't find his mind. Wow. Maybe because not, not so much that it's not there, but like disconnecting from the idea of the mind and pushing mistakes, but I was... Let's say about your stress, your anxiety. When you look at your stress or your anxiety, what happened with, with that kind of um, state of mind? For example, stress. Let's say if you have stress um, right before taking the test, right? And after you have you taken the, after you have taken the test, you still have the stress. Yes or no, right? Sometimes, right? But my point is, I want to explain to you is that that type of stress before taking the test and after uh, finishing that test is the same same level of stress or is different? Before and after is that what you're asking? Uh, before and after. Same or different? Well, it depends on how well you do on the test, too. Well, yeah, how you do on the test. So it depends, right? So it's, I mean, I mean that's, that's not equal, right? Mm -hmm. Not the same, right? So it may, it may be severe. This may, it may not be serious. And, and it's, some of you, do you have any stress whenever you walk into the room to take a test? And it work, and it work you? Or more has happened to you? Happen, right? Okay, you not stress me when you write the test, right? Right. But the point is, uh, if you have a stress, even before, even not talking about the test, but let's say when you go to have an interview, so for, right, when you deal with some important issue, the level of stress come up and down. Is that right? They is fluctuated, right? And this is, is impermanent. You understand that? It may come and go. The reason why he said, when he looked back his mind, his turbulent mind, like our stress, he could not find it because it's come and go. Make sense? Because what? It's not real. Make sense? If it's real, it's, it will be there. Make sense? So that reason why Buddha might say, I calm your mind already. Because you recognize, he recognized his stress is his illusion. Make sense? You recognize your stress is illusion or real? Mm -hmm. Real, right? Yeah. If it's real, it will last forever. But because it's come and go, I come with this view. It's the illusion. It's, a, it's not real. So if you attach to that, 
oh, I have a stress, you burn yourself out, right? But if you say, oh, yeah, because I have to deal with this type of important issue, so yes, I have some kind of level of stresses, but after that, that's okay. I can come back to my peopleness, state of mind. Make sense? All right, so that's why he said he calmed his mind already. Make sense now? Very clear? Okay, so when you look at, now, whichever things, uh, where whatever mental state of mind you have, right, that stress, anxiety, and so forth, they come and go, is that right? But how about, let me say, let me give you one more example. From morning until night, again, the stress level, if you have, right, it may come and go, it may up and down, right? And because it's impermanent, but how about your calmness and peacefulness? Calmness and peacefulness. If you remain, if you, re, if you keep that stress level, you burn yourself, is that right? You kill yourself too. Right? Many people, they cannot handle that kind of stress, anxiety, depression. That's why they, they harm themselves. But what happened? Calmness and peacefulness. If you can maintain from morning to night, you have that type of happiness. Is that right? That is the Buddha nature there. That's what he says to calm your mind there. Make sense? That is in Buddhist view. That's our pure nature. It won't, it won't it last forever. Make sense now? So whenever you deal with stress or anxiety, you remember it's their illusion. If you, if you remind yourself that, you you may transform that stress level much easier. You take things much easier way. Make sense now? Right? Okay. So let me come back here. So after that, he, yeah, he transmitted the, um, basically the drama to Haika. And um, of course, <coughs> the time for him to pass, uh, oh, pass uh, away. But uh, there's one man. He came back. He, he went. Oh, we see, and we're on the way coming back, he's, he's of Bodhidharma. Ho, ho, uh, let me sh show you these pictures, this image here. Um, okay, look at this one. This, 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 okay, it's not clear. There's many images about you. Actually, this one, this one here. Here. Actually, this one doesn't have the uh, issue. So according to the man who saw him, even they they build him on to the route, but later on he on the way back um, from OVC, he, he passed by, he, he, he encountered Buddha Dharma. And on the way, somehow he carried a stick, right, a star, and actually this one doesn't have a little bit fine. On the, at the end of this star, he's carried one shoe. Usually we, we wear two sh a, pair, a pair of shoes, right? But he carried only one shoe. What's mean? Who know what's mean by the meaning of one shoe? Remember? Any idea? No? Remember? Our mind, I told you, right? Our mind always luxuries between duality, right? Like, dislike, attachment, anger, good, bad, and so forth, right? See? That's why we wear, of course, we wear two shoes. We wear two shoes. That, that's the meaning of, of duality. The reason why he carry on one shoe, it represents what? Oneness of Buddha nature. Go beyond attachment of duality. Good, bad, life is like. Remember, that is the meaning of meditation. Remember I told you? Right? Go beyond the judgmental thinking, analytical thinking. Good, bad, like this, and so forth. If we go beyond that, we'll be sad. We'll be, we have that type of peacefulness and calmness here. So that's one legend. Now, legend is uh, um, many, 
uh, especially many um, Kung Fu master, uh, even now, uh, like Anna Shaolin Temple, they hook, they link him to them. Why? Because he's famous. According to Zen tradition, in China, there's no, his, he, he doesn't, he didn't teach the monks Kung Fu, but somehow, I don't know where, when this, the legend stopped. So they link him as a master of Kung Fu too. You understand that? You know, it's, it's normal, right? Sometimes people want to be famous, so that would be famous. That reason why they, they link themselves to the famous people, right? It's, it's common sense, it's normal. Okay, so that's just, that's just about his legend. Mm. And uh, about the tea, 